that the Son is set free. Is free indeed. No more chains of slavery. Truth has triumphed with liberty. He that the Son is set free is free indeed. Now I remember standing. On the auction block of sin, Satan had control of me, and he had the highest bid. But ownership was transferred one day at Calvary. When Jesus whispered, Son, I bought you so that I could set you free. He that the Son is set free. Is free indeed. No more chains of slavery. Truth has triumphed with liberty. He that the Son has set free is free indeed. Now I belong to Jesus. And I'm a child of the King, and I've traded filthy garments for robes of royalty. Now the chains that used to bind me, well, they're laying at my feet. You see, the devil can't make a lock that the Lord doesn't hold the key. He that the Son has set free. Is free indeed. No more chains of slavery. Truth has triumphed with liberty. He that the Son is set free is free indeed. He that the Son is set free. Is free indeed. Is free indeed. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Praise God. Praise, praise God. God. That's Woo. good. Woo. Well, that was perfect timing. That was perfect timing, wasn't it? It's good timing. Good timing. It's always a good time here. It's a good time. Oh, good morning, everybody. I see a lot of smiles. That makes me happy. Wow, it feels like everybody's getting ready, ramping up for summertime, right? Well, I know we have some young people, and I know they're ramping up for summertime, right? Moms, aren't you ready for summertime? Let's move on, please. <laughs> I've been told. Okay, no. Good morning, and y'all, it is, it's a beautiful day, a little bit of cloud coverage, you know, just enough to keep us cool coming to church this morning. Isn't God good? Yes, yes. He is. I mean, he kept me covered all the way to the church this morning. Wow. Yes. That's a whole lot of coverage. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's a long way. So. Oh, gosh, help us. Lord, Lord. Hey, tonight, tonight, ladies, if you don't have anything, even if you have something, cancel it. I'm not kidding. Um, tonight, we have the ladies meeting here at 530. And, you know, we're going to come. We're going to visit. We're just going to share some time in the Lord. And it's, it's a time for us ladies to get together. It's a time for us ladies to enjoy each other. And, you know, as we always say, iron sharpens iron. Sometimes we just need to step away from everything else that's going on and get together and just praise the Lord together. So y'all come out at 530 tonight. Um, I think they're going to have some finger foods and different things. If you want to bring something, I'm just, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, Sister Phyllis. I didn't know if you were here. Oh, so um, bring some, if you want to bring a finger food, great. If you don't want to bring anything, just come. We will feed you. I guarantee you the ladies at Cornerstone will not let you go hungry. I don't, I we don't have not that. gone hungry yet. I promise you. 
I walked out my door yesterday and there was a huge bag of blackberries, y'all. I was like, whoa, and then my husband seen them and he took them. Had a quality control check. <laughs> so anyway, y'all come out, please. And I, I am, I am begging, come out tonight, be a part of it. If you've never been here, I'm telling you, you'll be blessed if you have. You already know the ladies we have here are about the Lord. There's no judgment. Nobody here cares where you come from or don't come from. They just want to love on you. So, amen. And speaking of loving on each other, the senior team's meeting is on May the 26th. That's this Thursday. Where is it going to be? At the, right behind. Oh, here. yeah. I said that last week, I think. You did. Right here at the Trail Riders Cafe behind us, a.k.a. the Fellowship Hall, a.k.a. Sunday School. Y'all, it is our multi-purpose building. God's given us for everything. So um, bring a covered dish. Hey, if it's your favorite recipe, make it. This is the time to show it off. I'm telling you, because it's going to be a good time. That's 55 and over. Come out. Be a part of that blessing as well, because you will leave blessed. Um, all right. Let's see. May I have the wrong list here. All right. I think that's all the announcements. That's it. We're, we're about done with May, right? That's it. Yeah. It's about to be June, isn't it? Whew. We have no birthdays either. We have no birthdays, no anniversaries. This was, uh, <clears throat> this was in, kind in of New a, Iberia. This a was silent a time in week, history. <laughs> well, well, you know, everybody getting out of school and, and all that. Well, so. I do, I do want to say this. Listen, I want to to all of our young people that are here today. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for having the heart to go to school and to be a part of the community and the school you go to every day, showing your heart for Christ. Amen. Even if you're homeschooled, you're still in the public, you're still doing things, they're seeing your heart for Christ, and you're helping other young people come to know Christ. So keep smiling, keep shining, and you know what? This summer, don't drive mom too crazy. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Nobody wants a crazy mom. Especially not dad. <laughs> Lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. But it made my heart in love that I wrote my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus and tell him all about our troubles. He'll hear our famous cry, and he'll answer by and by. You feel a little prayer will turn in, no little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. Well, I go to him in prayer, and he knows my every care. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Let us have a little talk with Jesus, and tell him all about our troubles. He'll hear our famous cry, and he'll answer by and by. You feel a little prayer will turn in, and no little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. You find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Yeah, praise God. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. God is good, is he not?
Well, I'm gonna take a trip in that good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. And I'm gonna shout and sing until the heavens ring. And I'm bidding this world goodbye. I've good news to bring, and that is why I sing. All with you, my joy, I'll share. And when my ship comes in, I'm gonna leave this world of sin. I'll go sailing through the air. Cause I'm gonna take a trip in that good old gospel ship. Going far beyond the sky Oh, I'm gonna shout and sing Until the heavens ring And I'm bidding this world goodbye And I can hardly wait and I know I won't be late For so I'm gonna spend my time in prayer And when my ship comes in I'm gonna leave this world of sin And I'll go sailing through the air Cause I'm gonna take a trip In that good old gospel ship I'm going far beyond the sky Oh, I'm gonna shout and sing Until the heavens ring When I'm bidding this world goodbye when I'm bidding this world goodbye. Yeah. to fall in this place, God. Father, fill this place with your presence to overflow, God. God, touch lives this morning. Change hearts. Strengthen lives, God. Father, we thank you that we can come boldly before your throne, Father. Bringing our petitions, God, as children, Father. Father God, we come to you this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, God. This country needs revival, God, and we will continue to pray for revival until you bring it, Father. Father, for our troops all over this planet, Father, I pray that, God, that you would take care of them as they protect us. Protect them and take care of their families, God, while they are gone. Father, for our governor, our mayor, our chief of police, God, lead them in the way that you want them to lead, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Father God, we lift up our firefighters to you. God, we pray for protection as they serve, God. Father, we have two that are still 
burned victims from a fire explosion. Isaac Zamora and Gary Simon, Father, both kneeling on total healing in their body, Father. We pray, God, in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up Phyllis the Priest, Nelda A. Bear, Debbie Ashlock, Darlene Moody, James Strickland, Parker Mills, Jessica Brown, Sherry Gum, Travis, Jimmy Wyman, Mary Ann in Alberta, Canada, Jude Viator, Michelle Brandt, Joe Lede, Kelly, Connie Dale Miller, Jesse Rowe, Joey Lazard with a brain tumor, and Kirk Romero and Lynette, Father, all with cancer, God. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we come together in one mind and in one spirit, God. We pray that you would heal, God. Heal each and every one of them, God. Give them a, a special testimony of your love and your mightiness, God. Father, for healing, we pray for Kelly, Keisha, Carrie Abair, Stephen Bell, Missy Bonan, Nan Faulkner, Dalton Thibodeau, Raymond Romero, Debbie Broussard, Cindy Ronsonet, Jill Longlinay, Raymond Booty, Kirk Winthrop, Teresa Dugoff, Tiffany Gerard with back problems, Roy Pierce, Kathy Fontenot, Bernal Delahousie, Emil Collins, Ron Herbert, Blake Duset, Duet, Jamie Vasqua, David Patello, Liver Mass, Sadie Como, David Abshar, Janice and Preston Toops, Karen Norman, Je Jennifer Burrell, Michael Arnold, Carter Jude LeBlanc, Christina Rocca, Katie Taylor, Michelle Trahan, Tucker Tab. Father, we lift them up to you right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for a healing in their lives. Each one having each an individual need for healing. God, we pray that you would move and that you would touch right now in Jesus' name. Right now, I want us to do something. I'd like everyone to put your hands towards Brother Phil in the back. Right now, Brother Phil is having some problems in his back right now. Brother Sonny, lay hands on him, Father. We just come to you right now, Father. You know the problems that he's having in his body right now. We ask God for a healing, God. A healing in my brother right now. Move on his body, God. Heal and touch. Heal and touch, God. In Jesus' precious name. And God, we give you thanks in advance for what you are going to do in his life, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. Father God, we lift up prayer for Marty Trahan family as he has passed away, leaving a hole in their lives, God. God, fill their life. Fill that hole, God, that he has left, God, with your presence. Mr. Stephen Stansberry, that God would touch his life, God. You know the need in his life, Father. Dolores is still needing for you to find her a house, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Father God, we want to take time this morning, God, to give you praise. Father Sarah Boudreau is doing better. Ray Ann Connolly is doing better with her pacemaker surgery. Justin Delcom's surgery went well, anticipating another surgery to go well, and we pray for a speedy recovery. Roland Frugé, ribs are doing better. Michaela Elliston feeling 100% better, Father. And Jerry Lassolate. No cancer, Father. No cancer in Jesus' name. We give you thanks and we give you praise. God, once more, we thank you for what you have done. God, for what you are doing. And God, for what you are going to do in each and every one of our lives today. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen and amen. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Let anointing fall on me.
praise God. Praise God. Man alive. What a wonderful, wonderful day. I know this is going to be a great day. You know, as you get the opportunity to do things and you get to see God moving in people's lives and even in your own life, you know, you can uh, stand assured and know that he is always in charge. He is always in charge. Yes, he is. Praise God. Praise God. the mention of his name walls will crumble lives will change in the midst of life's temptation he's there to see us through this man in which I speak is here today for you and me. His name is Jesus, but you can call him as you please. They call him the Emmanuel, the King of all kings. He's the Son of the Father, the Prince of Peace. They call him Hosanna, the lighthouse at sea. He's the one angel, but he's a friend. But there's a peace in knowing that his forgiveness stays the same. Most famous in history, things he spoke, the whole world still reads. His name is Jesus, but you can call him as you. They call him Emmanuel, the King of all kings. He's the Son of the Father, the Prince of Peace. They call him Hosanna, the Lighthouse at Sea. He's the rock of ages, but he's a friend to me. They call him Emmanuel, the King of all kings. He's the Son 
Amen to that. What a good God we have, right? Man, 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 man. You know, I get excited just thinking about coming to church and hanging out with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, we got a good thing going here, people. Amen? What a good thing we have going here. And you know what? It's nothing that we did. We're just being obedient, coming together in his name. It's nothing that, you know, the, the church isn't growing because of the pastor. The church ain't growing because the people are friendly. The church is growing because God is here. Amen? Man, it's exciting. I am happy to be here. I'm happy to be in the midst people I love. How many of y'all brought your Bibles this morning? Amen. Amen. Today our lesson is going to be beware Jill. Beware Beware Jill. <laughs> Beware, it's coming. You know what? In God's timing, right? That's right. We're not going to get nervous. <clears throat> because here's the reason. I have it on authority that in this city, there's food served all the way to 2 o'clock. <laughs> Beware of leaven. Beware of leaven. See, a lot of people might not know what leaven is. Uh, man, let me tell you what. I, I love bread. Okay. Now, when I was a little kid, I was allergic to bread. And my mom said that they got to where they had to put the bread on the other side of the table. Because they said as little as you was with your arms folded, the second amen was said, you could reach across, grab a piece of bread, take off running, get behind the couch, and by the time we had you drug out, it was already gone. I love bread. I love bread to this day. Man, I, I mean, you want to get me excited, a big old hunking piece of bread with some butter or something on it, man, I get excited. I like bread. See, there's a lot of difference between bread with leaven in it and bread that has no leaven in it. You know, here's the difference, okay? Have any of y'all ever had those Hawaiian bread? It's about that thick and good and white. And then a tortilla. Big, hunking, wonderful, and then a tortilla. That's the difference between leaven and unleavened. Okay, you got it? Big, hunking, airy, light, wonderful French bread tortilla. Okay? Gordito. They all have their place, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I like a tortilla, too. And I, and I like crackers, too. But you put peanut butter and, and jelly on crackers, it ain't the same as on light bread. Amen? Right? I mean, you know, hey, but let's talk about leaven for a second. Leaven, in case y'all don't know, that's yeast, okay? Uh, if you're a baker, you know exactly what that is. See, leaven's mentioned several times throughout the scriptures. 
And uh, the Bible mentions leavens or yeast in several contexts. Uh, some of it in context is just literal leaven, just literal le yeast, okay? In other contexts, leaven is a symbolic uh, connotations of, of symbol, symbolistic on different things. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, like I said, if you know leaven causes dough to rise, uh, the process takes time. You take, uh, if anybody's ever done that, man, you know, you take, uh, you take that yeast and you put it in your, in your dough mix and then you, you've got to back off and leave it alone. Let it grow up, right? Um, and the longer you wait, the higher it gets to a point, right? Uh, one of my funny favorite stories of all time is this cowboy that his sister didn't want him being alone at the cook camp, so she gave him this cat. And he said he woke up and he had cat hair in his makings for his dough, and uh, that cat had to go. You know, uh, <clears throat> so the dough is important, and leaven is important in this to the point that you know we see a lot of times in scripture that it talks about unleavened bread right okay um so let's look at that for a second as to why they called it unleavened bread okay why that 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 was so significant of course we know that sin uh is set out to represent corruption is what one of the symbolic signs of leaven was but not only that See, if you remember back, uh, let's turn to Exodus 12, if you would. Um, how many people have your papers? If you do not have a paper with the scriptures on it this morning, put your hand up. Someone will come along. Keep your hand up until someone comes along and sticks one in your hand, okay? Just keep your hand up until someone does that. Um, you can tell that that uh, I just want to take the time while you got your hand up. This is a cowboy church. We don't take an organized offering so you can let go of your wallet. See, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't take up an organized offering. If, if you want to do so, there's a box back there in the back. And, uh, so, uh, but I didn't want you both sticking both hands up. I didn't want you to think you were getting robbed. Okay. So um, if you would turn in the scriptures to Exodus 12, 39. Exodus 12, 39. Uh, if anybody didn't get the paper, keep your hand up. Everybody got one? Fantastic. Fantastic. Got some down here on the front. Let's get some down here on the front for that. Uh, Exodus 12, 39. When you get there, say amen. And they baked unleavened cakes of dough, which they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. So, see, they, they basically got pushed out of Egypt. Not only did they get set free, but the Egyptians gave them gold and they gave them food and they gave them animals and they gave them all this stuff to get rid of them, man. They're like, hey, man, you get out of here. God's on your side. We don't want you around here anymore. You've caused too much problems. And don't wait for the yeast to rise in the bread. You get out of here right now. We're not waiting no eight, nine hours for no yeast to rise. And as you're traveling on the road, see, you don't wait for the yeast to rise either, right? Because you got to have the yeast out there and the, and the dough and dirt. And could you imagine... Could you imagine thousands of wagons hauling animals and, and people walking across desert and the, and the dust flying up? Boy, that'd be good bread, wouldn't it? Down to earth bread, that's for sure. <clears throat> Some of y'all catch that later on. <clears throat> Seeing to com commemorate this deliverance out of Egypt, God instructed the Israelites to celebrate a week of feasting every year called the Passover. See, the other name for the Passover, and you'll see this all throughout the scripture, is a ceremony of the unleavened bread. Okay? It was so important. Let's talk about how important it was. Turn to Exodus 12, 15. Let's go ahead and go to 14. Uh, 12, 14. When you get there, say amen. So this day shall be to you a memorial 
And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast, as an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. I'm serious about it. On the first day, they shall, you shall have a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat. That only may you prepare by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day through your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the month of the 14th day, the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a stranger or a native to the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. That's a serious man. To get cut off back then was basically a death sentence. A death sentence. Told him, said, man, if you don't do this, you cut off. You out of the shrine, boy. You're going to have to pack your bags and leave town. It was serious, right? I'm serious about it. Passover feast. We hear about that in the unleavened bread. Time and time again, we hear about that. See, elsewhere in the Mosaic Law, leaven represents sin or corruption. See, the law forbid that the grain offerings that they brought to the priest to offer to God had leaven in it. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus 2, 11. When you get there, say Amen. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in the offering to the Lord made by fire. See, so much to the point that even the priest. See, we read about that. Turn, if you would, to uh, Leviticus 6, verse 16. Leviticus 6, verse 16. And the remainder of it Aaron and his son shall eat. With unleavened bread it shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tabernacle. To the meeting they call, they shall eat. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as a portion of my offering by made by fire. It is most holy, like the sin offering, the trespass offerings. See, it was to the point that see they would they would take this, they would take their flour and they would mill it really fine. Uh, they'd take the grain, mill it in the flour really fine. They'd take and put frankincense over it, and they'd take and add oil to it. And it wouldn't have any leaven to it. And they'd bring it before the priest. And the priest would take this. And he'd take a handful of this and throw it into the fire on the altar as a sacrifice for their grain offering. And then they'd take the rest of it and take and meet it into a dough. Putting no leaven in it. They would cook it. And the priest were to eat that in a holy place. Because, see, that was God's, but he shared that with this, this reminds me of another time where God shared a meal with some apostles of the unleavened bread where he took the holy, the holy grain and used it and they ate it in the upper room. Amen? 
See, it should have been ate in a holy place. See, the, there was something special about this. Leaven, he didn't want it to be a part of, you know, whenever he said that they would remove it out of their houses even. That means anything that had yeast in it, they'd remove out of their house to make sure. Because, man, you didn't want to get cut off. See, that'd be wine that has yeast in it that causes the fermentation. Sauerkraut. Anything. Anything that had any yeast in it had to go. Had to go. Didn't want to take a chance with that. See, leaven's mentioned in the New Testament as well. Whenever leaven, which is called chametz, is used symbolically in the scriptures, it's a symbol of sin most time. Okay? Um, like in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7, it says your, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And it talks about not only just sin, but it also talks about, see, false doctrine as well. See, and we can find that uh, in Mark 8, 15, whenever Jesus says, then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. See, he also said the same thing, uh, Matthew 16, 12, he said, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. See, he used, it's used several times to represent false doctrine and false teaching. See, the works invisible. See, yeast is almost invisible when it works. It's a pattern, but whenever you put it in, you can't see it. But it magically starts working and permeating through the dough. See, all three of these religious sectors from the uh, Sanhedrin were spreading false teachings about Jesus. Let's turn, if we would, to Matthew 16. We're going to start with verse 1. When you get there, say amen. Matthew 16, verse 1. When you get there, say amen. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him, asking that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the end of times. The wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given unto you except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. And he left them and he departed. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, see, they'd come to test Jesus. See, but Jesus perceived that their true intent and the state of their hearts was wrong. See, later he warned his disciples against taken by these teachings. See, he says to them in verse 6, excuse me, in verse 5, now when the disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, take heed and be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we haven't taken no bread. 
But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand? Or do you not remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves or the 4,000? How many large baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they understood, and they did not, he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. See, then Jesus left those skeptical Pharisees and Sadducees and he got back on the boat with the apostles. And they're going across and see, Jesus understood that the 12 did not realize the dangers that was about to come up on them and upon him. See, they were facing a conspiracy from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. They had already started defecting people in masses brought about in large measure by false doctrines, teaching the leadership in these men. See, they hated him. See, they were going to leave no stone unturned until they disrupted and got rid of this Yeshua, this Jesus, this Messiah, and his ministry. See, the great, the great danger to the apostles on whom so much depended on the future, that was that they might become contaminated with false teachings. Of these combined enemies, those scheming Pharisees that just wanted Jesus gone. See, they'd placed Jesus in a trying position when they had asked him in front of the apostles and he wanted to make sure that the apostles didn't misunderstand what was going on. See, they asked him for a sign from heaven. The apostles were probably wondering, well, why didn't he just give them a sign? Because, see, the Torah says that the Messiah would give them a sign. See, the 12 must be warmed against the seductive influences and the hypocritical enemies that was before them who under the appearance of religious zeal were going to destroy both him and them. See, here's something that you may not know. See, Mark 8 and Matthew 16 are the same account. In one Jesus uses, in, in Matthew, Jesus uses the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Mark 8, he uses the Pharisees and Herod. People go, man, is that a contradiction? Well, no, see, you have to understand. Let's talk about who made up the Sanhedrin at this time. See, there was three actual parties. Does this sound familiar? There was a party of the Pharisees, there was a party of the Sadducees, and there was these parties of these Herodians. Now let's talk about what they were. See, the Pharisees would be kind of like, um, it, it didn't make any sense for these, thing, for these three to be together because they were in total opposition of each other. See, what it would be like, it would be like the Republicans, the Democrats, and then the real liberals. It's exactly what this looks like, okay? That's exactly what this looks like. And all three of them coming together to get rid of this one Jesus. See, let me tell you why it didn't make any sense for them to be getting along with each other, okay? See, the Pharisees, see, the Pharisees and the Herodians, that, that didn't even match up at all. They were arch enemies with each other. They were arch enemies. It would be like the Republicans and the great liberal. The, I mean, the super liberal and the Republicans coming together. That just ain't going to happen, right? See, that's what this looked like. See, the Herodians theologically were in agreement with the Sadducees. 
And politically, both parties, both the Sadducees and the Herodians, were in the opposite of the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees were Pharisees were all about the, the Mosaic rules, regulations, and they were anti-Herodian and anti-Roman. See, they were hoping that this Messiah, this kingdom, would remove the rule of Herod and remove the rule of the Romans. Whereas the Herodians wanted to please the Romans and preserve the Herod rule. Why? Because they had found that it politically correct for them to be a part of that, to be able to have power and to be able to move freely among the city. Sound familiar? And see, the Sadducees were as well. See, not only did they not believe in the resurrection, but they also had fell in line with Herod because, see, they found it politically correct to be in power of these Jews by having Roman influence. See, these three did not get along at all. The Sadducees and the Herodians were, were closer to getting along than the Pharisees and the Herodians. See, but all of a sudden, the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees all opposed Jesus. You know why? Because he was introducing a new kingdom that neither wanted. See, therefore, the final analysis was they had to kill this Jesus. He was going to mess up their standing. He was going to mess up their order. And they needed him gone. See, a little bit of their doctrine here or there could cause problems. See, not only was it, not only was it in statue of, not only was it just the, uh, just their statue in the community and, and their political views, but also the sin that had enveloped them. See, you can see that in Luke 12, 1. Jesus calls it out on the Pharisees. When you get there, say amen. In the meantime, when the innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you say spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed to the housetops. See, he called it out. He called it out. Hypocrisy. How, how could that be something that could, a little bit of that cause some problem? Well, let me show you. See, the hypocrisy that they had was they had let their, their rulings and their statue get in the way and be confused with what they thought was true holiness. See, they thought that the higher up they were, the more holy that they were. See, like the leaven that had gradually increased and spread in corruption had gradually puffed them up into a position of vanity. See, the lies and the hypocrisy can poison one's whole character. See, what started out to be someone who was studying the Word of God ended up being this statue of who they were. See, they were invited to parties and, and to be, to be the, uh, the center of attention and see, all this went to their head. And next thing you know, they're looking down on different people like the Samaritans and the Gentiles, those dogs. And they even, even when they prayed, they prayed, Lord, I know I'm not all the way correct, but at least I'm better than the Samaritans. See, they had this attitude 
that did not have the heart of Christ, did not have the heart of God. It had set them in a position that was all wrong. And it was dangerous. See, Paul warned the church of Corinth against tolerating sin in the midst using leaven as a metaphor. See, here, here's what we need to understand. We're all sinners. But there's a difference between sinning and living in sin. See, living in sin means that you know that it's wrong and you don't care. You're going to do it anyway. You've decided that, well, that's just the way it's going to be, and everyone's just going to have to understand that. See, we all sin. We know that to be a fact. See, what makes this so dangerous is Proverbs 14, 14 12 says that the ways of a man seem right to him and bring death. See, we can get twisted in what we want and what we need, and we can get twisted in thinking that the Holy Spirit's talking to us and bring us into a direction. See, if we don't know fully the Word of God, then we can get sidetracked pretty easy. I know that for a fact. Because, see, there's hundreds of cults in America there's a difference between occult and a cult. There's a hundred of a cults in America and across the world that have done just that, who have twisted the word of God just a little bit and brought in and allowed a little bit of yeast into the doctrine and has totally taken off and got them completely off course. See, Paul warned in 1 Corinthians. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, when you get there, say amen. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality and is not even named among the Gentiles. Did you hear that? He told them, said, man, this is so bad, the Gentiles won't even do this. They don't even know God. That a man has his father's wife. And you're puffed up about it. And have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged, as though I was present, him who has done this deed. They say, well, you can't judge me. Okay. You can put a collar on an alligator, but it don't make it a dog. You're smart enough to understand what's wrong and right. Okay. In the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along in my spirit, with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for his destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So what does that mean exactly? What he told them is, is, hey, pull this guy to the side and tell him, hey, man, you can't be doing that. You know it's wrong. It, it goes against everything that's ever been talked about. You know that it's wrong. Quit living like that. And you know what? If you don't repent of your ways, we're going we're gonna to exile you until you learn your lesson. You'll be cut, a, cut apart. You can't worship here anymore. Now, you might say, that that's tough, man. That guy's going to go to Satan. No, that guy's already with Satan. What that might do, what it's talking about, is it might awake him up inside to where the Holy Spirit talks to him. He is convicted of what he's doing wrong and makes it right and comes back into the fold. Someone say amen to that. 
See, there's a man in church who is guilty of sexual immorality. Paul told them to remove that man from fellowship because, like leaven, his influence would permit the whole church. Don't you know that a little le yeast leavens the whole batch? Let's read on right here. Starting in verse 6. When you get there, say amen. Your glorying is not good. In other words, going around telling everybody you're blessed and highly favored and living like that ain't good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since truly you are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. In other words, that old lifestyle, that was the lifestyle of a sinner. Christ has died for you. He has cleaned you up in through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're going to keep on returning to the old when you know better? Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, how can you eat from both plates? How can you sit there knowing what you're doing is not right, knowing what you're doing is against God's ordinance, but yet you come in, you pretend like everything's fine, you say, I'm blessed and highly favored, and you go on about your life eating and partaking just like off the Lord's plate. Can't be done. See, you've been cleansed. And what happens whenever you take fresh flour and you put a little of the old yeast in it? You've corrupted the whole batch. It says it again in Galatians 5, 9. Turn if you would there. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. She's talking about there. Go down. Galatians 5, verse 7. When you get there, say amen. See, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. See, what he's telling them is you were doing good. You had the message and the gospel and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That is enough. But you've allowed someone to come in and start giving you all these rules and regulations that you have to push besides that? Shouldn't be. So where's our danger of leaven today? See, we have this book here. It's wrote down for us. The words are here. We should know. Them. Some of us own the Bible 50 years, 60 years. We ought to know what's in it. So what's the danger? See, the danger, see, the New Testament speaks of us today, to us today, the same as he did to them, just as the letters were in correspondence to them, the exact same way. We're, we're having the same problem today that they were having 2,000 years ago. Same problem. It's so much a problem that every book in the New Testament, except for Philemon, Every book in the New Testament, except for Philemon, warns against false teachers, false prophets, false gospel, and false Christ. Matthew 24, 5 says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15 says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore is it no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, who end will be according to their works. 
Galatians 1, 8 and 9 says, but if, listen to this, but even if we or an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Did you hear that? Even an angel, if an angel from heaven comes down and says something different, he needs to be accursed. Why? Because if it's not of God and God don't change his mind, then it is not correct. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We know this. So this brings conclusion. Counterfeit prophets who speak of counterfeit Christ, who preaches a counterfeit gospel, can yield only a counterfeit salvation. I'm going to say that again. A counterfeit prophet who speaks of a counterfeit Christ, who preaches a counterfeit gospel, can only yield a counterfeit salvation. 2 John chapter 1, verse 7. When you get there, say amen. Thank you all for looking up scripture. When you get there, say amen. You know, sometimes I pause. And I hear people looking up scripture. And I'm going to tell you this. If y'all are going to take the time to look up scripture, I'm going to take the time and pause and wait for you. We're not in that big of a hurry. I would rather you visually put your eyes on this word of God and put your hands and feel it and get the meaning of it than to run through and stay exactly on time. Are we okay with that? Praise God. Second John chapter 1, verse 7. When you get there, say amen. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose the things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house. Do not greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. What's he talking about there? See, he's talking to us just as he is talking to them. See, what John is warning against here is the kind of action that we should lead by watching what the world who watches us believes that we're tying ourselves to. Think about this, people. As ambassadors of Christ, the torchbearers of God's word, of the true gospel, if we're in the same team as these deceivers, See, we must not allow an opportunity for the church or the world to be confused about the true gospel. See, I'm all about unity and community in Christ. But I want to make sure we're tied in with the same Jesus. See, there was, there was a deal that come to Louisiana here a couple of months ago called Let Us Worship. A big deal. They rented the Cajun Dome. They tried to get every pastor in town to, to bring their church over there. See, this was tied in with a group of, from California, this Bethel music group. 
And if you haven't looked into that, see, they don't believe in the same Jesus we believe in. They believe in a Jesus that he wasn't God until after he died and he earned his Godship. That's not my Jesus. They believe in such things as laying on graves and soaking up the energy from the dead. This is witchcraft, people. But yet, there's pastors who went and took their flocks and took them right on over to the Cajun Dome and sat around and sang songs about Jesus. But you know what? It wasn't the same Jesus as my Jesus. We've got to watch who we hold hands with. See, if you publicly receive a false teacher, you may give watching eyes a false impression that the deceiver is not dangerous at all. You say, well, what can that do with a concert? Well, the concert gets people this day and time with their phones to like that song, and they like the way the guy sang, and they like the way he looked, and they like what he said, so they, so they pull up on their phone, they look up Bethel Music and, and, or Elevation Worship or Hillsong, and they look that up, and, and, uh, and they, they look up other songs because that's what we do. Whenever we like someone, we look up things that, that they're tied to, Right? Next thing you know, they find this Bethel music, and next thing you know, they're watching services from Bill Johnson, and they're being led astray. And whenever you come and tell them that they're wrong, they say, well, wait a second, didn't you bring us all over to this guy, and, and we worship together? How wrong could he be? So, so then emotions get involved, and next thing you know, people are falling away from God. Why? Because there is no consistency in the word, unless we uphold the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us God. What this means practically for those in ministry, that's all of us. So we should not in any way or circumstance lock arms with heretical teachers, pastors, authors, Musicians, professors, anyone in any capacity who comes to you bringing a different Jesus. That means no conferences, no articles, no book recommendations. Let's keep this real, people. Confederate counterfeit Jesus, false salvation. Not the same Jesus. Mormons. We believe that Jesus is the half-brother of Satan. That is not my Jesus. That is not my God. The only Son of God. Muslims and other religions believe that Jesus is a prophet. That he's not the son of God. That's not my Jesus. That is not my God. There's other religions that believe that Jesus didn't atone for our sins on the cross. All he did was come here and he was just a man that set a good example of how we should live. That's not my Jesus. That is not my God. People who believe that he's not the son of God. That is not my Jesus. That is not my God. He's the Lord of Lord and the kings of kings. There's, there's groups out there that believe that Jesus is the same as Michael the archangel. That is not my Jesus. That is not my God. He was not created like an angel. He's a deity. There's those that believe that he was just some angel. Not my Jesus, not my God. I can't worship with you. There's those that don't believe that he was born of the Spirit and a virgin. That's not my Jesus. That's not my God. And I can't worship with you. There's those that believe that he earned his Godship. That ain't my Jesus. That ain't my God. John 1 tells us that the word was with God, the word was God, and everything was made through the word, which means he was there from the very beginning.
There's those that believe that he wasn't full deity from the beginning. Well, John tells us he was. So the word of God is either wrong or you're wrong with your doctrine. I'll stick with the word of God that has not been proved wrong yet. They believe that the one, that he's not the one and the only way to heaven. Once again, turn if you would to John 14, 6. Come on up, Ben. John 14, 6, when you get there, say amen. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, now, I'm going to throw things a little sideways on you. These groups that believe that he was just a prophet, prophets can't lie. So the word of God right here is the same word that they studied. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if he lied about it, Jesus said, I'm the son of God. That blows that out of the water. He wasn't just a prophet. If he was a prophet, he was also deity and God. Why? Because he said so and prophets can't lie. It's good, isn't it? There's holes all in their game. See, there's cults, people. See, y'all may not understand what a cult is. We're going to talk about it real quick. The definition of a cult. And I want you to listen to this. And whenever I say this, I want you to think back in your mind. A cult, we mean a group, religious in nature, which surrounds a leader or a group of teaching which either denies or misinterprets the essential biblical doctrine. So if you say that Jesus is not the son of God, or you say he earned his Godship, or if you say he was a prophet, or if you say anything else than what the word of God says, that's against essential biblical doctrine. Most cults have a single leader, or a succession of leaders who claim to represent God's voice on earth. So let that sink in. Who claim to represent God's voice on earth and who claim authority greater than the Bible. See, God's word cannot be changed. Why? Because God doesn't change his mind. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. So if there's someone claiming to be God's voice, and then if it doesn't line up with the word of God, see, culture... Cultic teachings claim that they're in harmony with the Bible, but denies one or more of the cardinal doctrines presented within. Just one. It's either all true or it's all wrong. You, you can't take all of this right here and take one thing and remove it, and we're still worshiping the same God and the same Jesus together. You're either on board with the whole thing or you're out in my eyes. Does that mean that we should cut them off and not talk to them about the word of God? Absolutely not. See, there's people out there with good hearts who are led astray. It's our job, people. It's our job to stand up, stand true, call it for what it is. You can meet with those people. You can discuss the word of God without worshiping together with them. you have sin in your life, if you have sin that's led you, if you've allowed yeast to come in 
and disrupt the beauty of Christ in your life. Let us all stand. If you've allowed doctrine or, or traditions or things to get in the way of your perfect relationship with Christ, if, if what you're doing in your worship does not line up with the Word of God, if, if you've allowed the smallest thing into it, right now is the time that we cleanse ourselves from all that old yeast, that we remove it right now. Any sin that's hindering your walk with Christ right now, any sin that you're living in, not sins that's come about, but sins that you're living in that you've allowed to interrupt your relationship with Christ and with the church, right now is the time that we get rid of that. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word of truth that we can, we can go to the grave knowing that your word is true. Lord, thank you for your infallible word. Lord, I ask that you give us the discernment to be able to test spirits, to know what's of you and what is not. That anything that we've allowed to get in between us and you, if you've allowed something to get in between you and God, just put your hand up. It's time to throw it to the cross right now. Take your hand up and put it up and say, Lord, I, I, I take this right here and I'm going to throw it to you. I'm going to let you handle it because I don't want it in my life anymore. And let's just throw it. Let's throw it to the cross. And we're done with it. It's out of our life for good. Now we're going to pray. Lord, we ask right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray with me silently or pray out loud. Lord, these things that we've allowed into our life, we cancel them out in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask for a hedge of protection around us to not let them creep back into our life. Lord, that you cleanse us of all yeast that's bothering us and, and has moved us in directions that don't line up with you. Right now in Jesus' name, we ask for forgiveness and we thank you for the cleansing that you put on our body today and on the body of Christ. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody give Jesus Christ a hand. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Oh, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation.